This video is going to be on metal carbonyl bonding at an undergraduate level. Some of you watch my other videos for A-level knowledge. This is not A-level. So don't worry about sticking around if you're an A-level student, unless you're interested then by all means watch this video. But for you undergraduate people, we need to talk about the metal carbonyl bonding in organometallic complexes. So first of all, what actually is a metal carbonyl bond? Well, it's a metal and a carbon monoxide ligand, also known as a carbonyl, bonding to each other. Uh, to truly understand what's going on, we first need to look at the structure of carbon monoxide itself. Feel free, if you're comfortable with the structure, to skip a couple minutes forwards where we're talking about the bonding, but if not, stick around and we'll go through it together. So, first of all, let's look at a brief, a very brief um, molecular orbital diagram for carbon monoxide. Computers have generated more accurate models. This is going to be very rough just to demonstrate some of the bonding that's taking place. So we've got our 2S and our 2P for oxygen and carbon. We know we have four electrons for carbon and six electrons for oxygen. What happens now? Well, we're going to get some interactions and a few correlations li lines. We get a nice sigma and sigma star interactions between the two s orbitals. And I'm just going to draw them the correlation lines very roughly. What we also get is we get a degenerate pair of pi bonds originating from these p orbitals. We also get one sigma bond originating from these p orbitals, and as such, we also get the antibonding versions of these. Okay, now we need to just populate this simply. These electrons, which are mainly made of uh, S character, go in those molecular orbitals. And then we have a further two, four, six to go. So one, two, three, four, five, six. From this diagram here, we can quite clearly see that we have two pi bonds and one sigma bond coming from uh, mainly those p orbitals. We will get some electron density coming from the s, but it's mainly those p orbitals. We can use this to come up with a structure for carbon monoxide. So CO, let's draw it out like this. As we've got one sigma coming from mainly the p orbitals, we could have a sigma overlap, as you may well be aware, of some of the p orbitals. It looks a bit like this. If I change the colour, we can also have one of these pi bonds coming out on this axis. Let's, let's call this the z-axis. Let's call that the x-axis, and let's call the one coming out towards us the y-axis. So we've got a sigma bond on the x-axis. We're now creating a pi bond on the z-axis, and also if I change the colour once again, we would have p orbitals coming out towards us, going into the screen and coming out of the screen, and we'd get a nice pi overlap like that. Overall what this means is we can draw the carbonyl ligand or carbon monoxide a bit like this. If you want to, you can put some charges on there, but overall it's just the C triple bond O, and we have a nice lone pair sticking out of that carbon as such. This is important as I then go on to the next thing. So we're going to look at the metal to carbonyl bonding. So first of all, we've got this lone pair on the carbonyl ligand. We can have an empty orbital. I'm not going to state which one on the metal. It all comes down to the complex. But we have an empty d orbital on that metal, which can be in phase and can overlap with the lone pair on the carbon forming a coordinate bond between the two. But not only that, we can increase the strength of this bond through something called a pi back bonding. I'm now going to talk about pi back bonding and why it's a big game changer in this type of carbonyl metal bonding. So let's have our generic CO. I haven't drawn the third bond because I'm now going to draw the actual orbital out itself. We've got our nice metal here and we've got our coordinate bond going from the carbon to the metal. 
So the pi back bonding involves the pi bond, or not the pi bond, I should say the anti-bonding orbital of the pi bond. So I'll just draw out the pi bond here. Got a lovely overlap here, as you would expect. But at the same time, if we flip back to our molecular orbital diagram, we've also got these pi anti-bonding orbitals, right? Pi star. With that, they, they all look, for example, could look a bit like this, as they've got to be out of phase. Draw the black and the white lobe, or the plus and the minus lobe, whichever you prefer. Kind of out to the side a little bit and out of phase. What this also means is it's slightly closer to that metal orbital. And if the metal orbital has the right phase, as such, we can get some back bonding. So this is one of the D orbitals. If I was to assign some axes, let's say Z and X once again, this would be the DXZ orbital, as you may be familiar with. And this will contain some electron density. You may have some other ligands coming in around or just from this coordinate bond from the carbonyl here, you've got some electron density somewhere in that d orbital. What can happen is this can overlap with the pi star antibonding orbital and give some of the electron density to the antibonding orbital. It's strictly going from the metal to the carbonyl antibonding orbital because once again, if we flick back to that molecular orbital diagram, you can see these are empty, right? It can only accept electron density. Hence, as you may have seen from the spectrochemical series, carbon monoxide is a pi acceptor. Not a pi donor, not neutral, it's a pi acceptor. Why? Because the antibonding orbital and the d orbital can donate some electron density. The d orbital can donate some electron density to that pi antibonding orbital. And to be honest, that's all there is about carbonyl bonding. You've got a sigma bond, as a recap, going from the, if I change that to orange, we've got sigma bond going from the lone pair on the carbon to the metal center there. And then we've got some lovely pi back bonding coming from one of the d orbitals to the pi antibonding orbital of one of those pi bonds here. I hope that makes sense. I hope it's increased your understanding of the topic. Please like, share and subscribe for more. I'm hoping to do some more undergraduate videos as time goes on, so please be patient. Like I said, give it a thumbs up and that will encourage me to do more videos as I know people are watching it and liking them. Thank you.